maghfirat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala karena berkat rahmat dan hidayahnya kita dapat berkumpul di tempat ini dalam keadaan sehat walafiat. Praise and gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Allah's presence because it is only with Allah's grace and guidance that we can convince in this place in good health. Salawat and greetings we convey to the presence of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Yang kami hormati, Dekan Fakultas Kedokteran Universitas Erlangga atau yang mewakili, yang kami hormati, Kepala Departemen Bedah Toraks Kardiak dan Vaskular Fakultas Kedokteran Universitas Erlangga, Dr. Heru Subroto Spesialis Bedah Spesialis BTKV Konsultan, yang kami hormati, Ketua Program Studi Bedah Toraks Kardiak dan Vaskular Fakultas Kedokteran Universitas Erlangga, Dr. Dr. Yan Evrata Sembiring Spesialis Bedah Spesialis BTKV Konsultan, dan seluruh staf dan residen bedah torak kardiak dan vaskular fakultas kedokteran Universitas Erlangga yang saya banggakan. Allow me to greet our honorable guest, Dean of the Faculty of Medicine Universitas Erlangga, or the representative, Head of the Department of Thoracic Cardiac and Vascular Surgery Faculty of Medicine Universitas Erlangga, Dr. Heru Subroto, SPB, SPB TKV Konsultan, Koordinator of Residency Program of Thoracic Cardiac and Vascular Surgery Faculty of Medicine Universitas Erlangga, Dr. Dr. Ian Evrata Sembiring, SPB, SPB TKV Konsultan, and all staff and resident of Thoracic Cardiac and Vascular Surgery Faculty of Medicine Universitas Erlangga. Pada hari ini, Departemen Bedah Toraks Kardiak dan Vaskular Fakultas Kedokteran Universitas Erlangga dengan bangga mempersembahkan guest lecture dengan judul Contemporary Management of Severe Aortic Stenosis from Surgical Aortic Valve Replacement to Transcatheter Aortic Valve Implantation oleh Dato Sri Dr. Jeffrey Jeswandilon, FRCS CTS AM, Senior Konsultan Kardiotoracic Surgery dari National Heart Institute Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Today, the Department of Thoracic Cardiac and Vaskular Surgery Faculty of Medicine Universitas Erlangga proudly presents a guest lecture entitled Contemporary Management of Severe Aortic Stenosis from Surgical Aortic Valve Replacement to Transcatheter Aortic Valve Implantation delivered by Dato Seri Dr. Jeffrey Jeswandilon, FRCS, CTS, AM, a senior consultant cardiothoracic surgery from National Heart Institute, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Sebelum kita memasuki acara inti, marilah kita membuka acara pada hari ini dengan mengucapkan basmalah. Before starting, let's begin by saying basmalah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Acara selanjutnya, menyanyikan lagu kebangsaan Indonesia Raya, dilanjutkan dengan himne Erlangga dan himne BTK. Okay. I would like to invite the audience to rise for the national anthem followed by the Erlangga himne and BTK Ferry himne.
Hadirin dipersilahkan untuk duduk kembali. Acara selanjutnya, bacaan doa oleh saudara kita, Dr. Muhammad Rizky Bakhtiar. Kepada Dr. Muhammad Rizky Bakhtiar, kami persilahkan. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me lead the prayer to begin this event in Islam. Alhamdulillahirabbil alamin. Hamdan yuwafi ni'mahu wa yukafi mazidah. Ya Rabbana lakal hamdu. Kami yang bagri jalali waji wa zimi sultani. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammad. Rabbana zalamna anfusana wa in lam taghfir lana wa tarhamna lanakuna minal khasirin. Rabbana wala tahmil alina islan kama hamaltahu ala lazina min qabli rabbana wala tuhamilna malata qatala nabihi wa fu'anna wa gafir lana warhamna anta maulana fansuruna ala kaumil kafirin na taqabal minna innaka antas sami'ul alim Allahumma inni as'aluka iman nafian warizkun ta'iban wa amalan mutakobbalan Rabbana alina fit dunia hasana akhirati hasana wa kina asabana Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Acara selanjutnya sambutan kepala Departemen Beratorax Kardiak dan Vaskular Fakultas Kedokteran Universitas Airlangga kepada orang tua kami, Dr. Heru Subroto, spesialis bedah, spesialis BTKV konsultan, kami persilahkan. To our beloved father, Dr. Heru Subroto, SPB, SPB, KV konsultan, the floor is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera semuanya. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you to each and every one of you for being here today at this wonderful place. It is such an hour for me to speak on behalf of the Department of Thoracic Cardiac and Vascular Faculty of Medicine, Airlangga University. And I would like to express my appreciation to Vice Dean Dr. Hani Patria, MD and PhD neurologist, who helped us make this guest lecture come true. And by giving you a warm welcome to our guest, our special guest, Dato Sri Dr. Cheswan Dilon, FRCS, CTS. AM from Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery Institute, Jantung Negara, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, who will enlighten us in heart valve surgery, particularly contemporary management of severe aortic stenosis from surgical aortic valve replacement to transcatheter aortic valve implantation. As a John, we have to understand fully about heart valve problem and how to proceed treating specific cases. Many surgical modalities have emerged nowadays and TV has become one of solution in treating aortic stenosis in high risk patient. At the end of this lecture, I hope we understand more about aortic surgery and eventually improving our patient care. Thank you and enjoy the lecture. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Acara selanjutnya, sambutan Wakil Dekan 2 Fakultas Kedokteran Universitas Erlangga 
kepada Ibu Dr. Dr. Hanik Badria, Badria Hidayati Spesialis Saraf Konsultan, kami persilahkan. Next, we would like to invite the second vice dean of the Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Erlangga, to Dr. Dr. Hanik Badria Hidayati, SPS Konsultan, time is yours. Thank you very much. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to our distinguished guests, Datuk Seri Dr. Jeffrey Deswan Dillon, FRCS CTS uh, AM, and the Head of Department of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery, Dr. Heru Subroto, Spesialis Bedah, Spesialis Bedah TKV Konsultan, and also Dr. Yan Evrata Sembiring, Spesialis Bedah, Spesialis Bedah TKV Konsultan, also all of the senior staff and students, respected college, ladies and gentlemen. According to the latest data from World Health Organization, cardiovascular diseases are the leading cause of death globally. And taking into account an estimated 17.9 million lives, uh, lives each year. In Indonesia itself, heart disease and stroke are also ranked first and the highest cause of the death. Therefore, this matter needs special attention and the role of experts in this field is truly needed. Luckily, today, we will have a special guest lecture entitled Contemporary Management of Severe Aortic Stenosis from Surgical Aortic Valve Replacement to Transcatheter Aortic Valve Implantation, which will be delivered by an expert from cardiothoracic uh, surgery, Datuk Seri Dr. Jeffrey Jeswan Dillon, FRCS, CTS, EM, Mall. He is a senior consultant of cardiothoracic surgery of National Heart Institute, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Thank you for your coming and willingness to share your ideas in this occasion. We are honored to have you here. And ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Dean of Faculty Medicine of Universitas Erlangga, Surabaya, Indonesia, I really appreciate this guest lecture activity. Since the mission of the Faculty Medicine of Universitas Herlangga is to increase the international ranking. So it is important to improve the international awareness and collaboration. This guest lecture program might be a simple program, but we do hope so. We do hope that it will, it will give us a great impact for the future international collaboration. Moreover, I really hope that this event can be strategic forum for all college to update knowledge and insight, expand network, and which it uh, certainly very useful for improving the quality of services, especially related of the cardiothoracic surgery. In the name of Allah, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, I open this guest lecture forum. Thank you very much for your attention and please enjoy the lecture. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Acara selanjutnya, sesi foto bersama kepada seluruh partisipan untuk mengambil tempat di tengah podium. Next, we would like to take a photo together. Cardiothoracic Surgery, Heart and Lung Transplant, St. Vincent's Hospital, Sydney, Basic Mitral Repair Training, Advanced Mitral Repair Training, Ultimate Mitral Repair Training di Bangkok, Mastering Mitral Valve Repair di Vietnam, dan Minimal Invasive di Leong, France. To our moderator for this lecture, Dr. Dr. Yan Evrata Sembiring, SPB, SPB TKV Konsultan, the stage is you. Thank you, terima kasih. MC, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues yeah, yang hadir uh, offline di uh, Aula 
Fakultas Kedokteran Universitas Erlangga ataupun yang online di uh, Zoom ya. Uh, kami mengucapkan selamat datang kepada kita semua dan terima kasih sudah bergabung bersama kami untuk acara guest lecture pada Jumat siang ini di mana kita sangat bersyukur pada siang hari ini kita mendapat tamu dari uh, Institut Jantung Negara yaitu Dr. Jeffrey Jeswan Dilon yang beliau ini adalah seorang kardiotoracic surgeon senior consultant di Institut Jantung Negara Malaysia. Pada siang hari ini beliau akan menampilkan kuliah umum yang diberi judul Contemporary Management of Severe Aortic Stenosis from Surgical Aortic Valve Replacement to Transcatheter Aortic Valve Implantation. Dr. Datuk Sri Dr. Jeffrey Jeswan Dilon adalah Director Cardiovascular Sport and Fitness, the Senior Consultant Cardiothoracic Surgeon di Institut Jantung Negara Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Uh, saya banyak sekali, seperti yang ada tampil di kurikulum VT, ada 40 lembar kurikulum VT-nya beliau, jadi luar biasa. Beliau ini adalah salah satu uh, kandidat uh, ejang profesor di Departemen Bedah Torak, Kardiak, dan Vaskular Fakultas Kedokteran Universitas Airlangga. Ada beberapa prestasi yang beliau dapat, yaitu adalah First in Man Surgery, ya, beliau adalah uh, First in Human Implantation of Fan Pouch Ventricle Receiving Device for Functional Mitral Regurgitation, Kemudian first in Asia Pacific to perform endoscopic ablation for atrial fibrillation. Kemudian mitral valve repair with biodegradable annuloplasty ring. And first in Asia to perform a weak coronary CBG uh, December 2004. And also Dr. Jeswan Dillon is first in Asia to perform sutureless aortic valve replacement, transcatheter aortic valve implantation. And it's a lot of uh, CV. I think uh, it's not enough one day to read the, all the curriculum VT of Dr. Jeswan Dilon. Jadi tak perlu panjang waktu lagi. Please welcome our distinguished guest like uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Jeswan Dilon. Please, time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh dan selamat siang Dr. Hero, Dr. Yan, specialist-specialist, uh, uh, residents, tuan-tuan uh, tuan-tuan. Uh, first and foremost, this is a big privilege for me. I thank you for inviting me here and giving me the honor of giving you a lecture in this prestigious university of yours. Um, I have a disclaimer to make. Uh, I don't usually dress as casual as this, although I'm comfortable, but I arrived this morning and my baggage did not arrive. So I arrived in my traveling clothes. Uh, it's no disrespect to the occasion. I just want to make it clear. I actually came prepared with my nice Surabaya batik shirt for this location, but unfortunately, it's my back. Yeah? All right, maybe another occasion. Yeah? All right. The other disclaimer I want to make is not known to many of you. I have an affiliation with Yunus Firstas Ailanga. When I was a medical student, uh, I came to this university for the first time. In fact, I remember it very much because it was my first overseas trip. I came as a student exchange program, part of uh, my university in Indonesia, particularly with University Ailanga. So it's in a way, whenever I come back here, it reminds me of homecoming. So thank you very much again for the opportunity. 
Right, uh, the title today is Contemporary Management of Aortic, Severe Aortic Stenosis from Surgical AVR through to Transcatheter Aortic Valve Implantation. And I'll add on and beyond as a third part of it. Now, why I chose this topic to address you because this for several reasons. This is a evolving topic, meaning that's a lot to talk about from how evolution of treatment for, for aortic stenosis is, how the changes affect the treatment, and how the revolution of transcatheter implantation has now changed the landscape. And it's not just a steel target, it is still a moving target, and we like to look into the future and think that what are the potential developments on this. The second reason I chose this topic because is is as medicine is moving now, particularly in the space of cardiovascular disease, uh, we are no more in a single specialty. So treatment of aortic stenosis is an example where we will introduce what a heart team concept is because management of the patients transgress every specialty. It's just not cardiac surgery, cardiology, we include anesthesiology, sometimes vascular surgery, radiologists, all into the planning of this patient. So the, sum, the brief synopsis of my talk, as you can hear, I'm going to talk first on aortic stenosis, what the disease means, how surgical AVR has been the mainstay of treatment, uh, and then we'll move on into the revolution of TAVI, transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Importantly, which patient should get TAVI, which patient should get surgical AVR. And next, we look to what is the future. To start with, with the more junior staff here in the audience, uh, I'd like to run through very briefly that the heart consists uh, of four chambers, and with these four chambers, there are four heart valves. The function of a heart valve is to allow a unidirectional flow of blood in a forward direction. So there would not be any interruption of flow from obstruction or regurgitation. However, in disease shown in the picture here, the two most common disease to affect these heart valves are mitral regurgitation and aortic stenosis. For this guest lecture this afternoon, we are going to talk about aortic stenosis. So what is aortic stenosis? Aortic stenosis is the narrowing of the aortic valve as part of a degenerative, sometimes aging process. When this happens, calcium is deposited onto the aortic valve leaflets and the valve gets hardened and it doesn't open and close as it usually should. The clinical effects of this are seen in this uh, slide. Uh, the typical symptoms when the aortic valve is narrowed is one of three. Shortness of breath, because the heart has to work extra hard. Angina chest pain, or a syncope attack, a fainting episode. It's important to see in the graph shown there, before a patient gets symptoms, the, the, the disease progress is very slow. It's quite innocent. But once at the onset of symptom, the time, the clock starts. Because from the onset of symptoms till death, the period is very short. It's been said that about 50% of people are dead in two years, yeah? So, uh, so this is a deadly disease and we have to pay particular attention to this. Now, for many years, for 50 years, surgical aortic valve replacement has been a mainstay of treatment. We know this is a very good operation. It's done through median stenotomy to the front of the chest. It gives good, uh, can be done safely with low operative mortality, low stroke rate, low paravalvular leakage around the implanted valve. Uh, valve hemodynamics are very good. 
And this chart shown that even the good can be made better. Over a period of time, the mortality rate keeps on dropping. This slide is a little bit dated. It shows that the lower end of mortality for elective AVR is 2%. Now I think we're trying to record probably 1% for uh, elective AVR. So what is surgical AVR? So it is a operation run through the front of the chest, a median sternotomy. The sternum is split open. The disease valve is excised, means the disease leaflets are taken out and being implanted with a prosthetic valve. There are two, two big groups of prosthetic valves the mechanical valve and the biological valve, also called bioprosthesis or tissue valve. Both has advantages and disadvantages. The mechanical valve, one, uh, the advantage of it potentially lasts the patient's lifelong. Uh, the disadvantage, the patient has to take anticoagulation with coumadin or warfarin lifelong. And with that comes the possibility of complications of coumadin which is valve thrombosis and bleeding. On the other hand, the biological valve, the advantage is it, you do not need to take anticoagulation. It's a big advantage. The disadvantage is it is a time-limited valve. That means given time, it will degenerate. Degenerate mainly by cal calcification de deposits onto the prosthetic valve leaflets. This is an evolution of design of the valves that put on the top panel, the mechanical valves. Uh, you can see it started early on from a design called what's a ball and cage design. And then it went to a, what is called a single leaflet tilting this design. And now it is all most of mechanical valves are a by leaflet design. On the lower panel, there are basically two kinds of uh, tissue valves. One is made from porcine tissue, which is made from the actual valve of the uh, pig. And the other valve is a bovine pericardial valve. It is not a valve of the cow, but it's made from the pericardium uh, manufactured by it. In most practices, certainly in ours, in mine in Malaysia, we predominantly use a bileaflet mechanical valve and a bovine pericardial tissue valve when it's option. Tissue valve has its benefit. It has a limited lifespan, but at the limited lifespan of degeneration is age related. In, in the elderly age, you can see it lasts a lifetime. It lasts quite long durability up to 15, 20 years before it cuts off. In the younger age group, this is degeneration is accelerated. If we draw a cutoff point, it takes 65 years old as where above 65, it degenerates slow, below 65, it generates, degenerates faster. And this is what is seen in the guidelines. This is the basis of the guideline, how you choose a valve prosthesis. Focus on the one in the red box, the one uh, guidelines for aortic valve, Less than 50 years old guidelines recommend a mechanical valve. More than 65 years old recommend a tissue valve. The in-between group of 50 to 65, it's open to discussion between the patient, family members, and the physician. So this is a, an informed decision. Everyone, every stakeholder's opinion being taken into. With that in mind, there has been when to choose mechanical or tissue valve. Certainly when I started my residency and go up, there were a lot of mechanical valves. Yeah. Uh, the, when I started my training, there were a lot more mechanical valves. But over time, you can see the landscape has changed dramatically in favor of the tissue valve. This is from STS data. You can see the ratio of valves being implanted in the United States. It's a six to one. Six, six tissue valve to one mechanical valve. There are many reasons for this. Reasons being one is uh, expected age. Uh, patient's lifespan is increased, life expectancy. 
with life expectancy increase, the old elderly group has other kinds of diseases, maybe need operation, they don't want to take warfarin. Another big trend of change are people that goes into healthy lifestyle and uh, patients want to be very active and they don't want to take warfarin. So all, and the, the, the other reason for this is the uh, newer generation of tissue valves uh, get better and they last longer than the previous generation. Okay, so we will move next into the next phase of evolution. So we've said the standard treatment, gold standard, is through a median stenotomy. But of the last 30 years or so, minimally invasive aortic valve surgery has been proposed. There are two methods that have been proposed. One is through a upper median stenotomy, and the other is through a right anterior thoracotomy. Why minimally invasive? What are the benefits? There are numerous benefits. You reduce operative pain, there's faster recovery of the patient, faster respiratory function recovery, less operative, less uh, blood transfusion, and the patient uh, goes back to work and full activity faster than usual. Sorry, I'm trying to coordinate myself with the uh, iPad and the <laughs> slideshow here. There's a lag delay. Now, this is an example of how we can do it. If you can do it, if you can move and do the same operation as good as AVR from this incision, if you can do it through a smaller incision, please go ahead and do it because the advantages to the patient is so remarkable. However, That being said, it's not easy to do this operation. There's a steep learning curve to do minimally invasive. Why? Because you look, the surgeon is used to looking at a big operating field. Now you're making the hole smaller. You're doing keyhole surgery. So with this, it needs to have a learning curve and adaptation. So the adoption rate for this, you can see in the SDS, is only about 20 to 30%. So it's good, but it's certainly difficult. However, all is not lost. There are technology that has been involved that help to make this doable. I'm going to show some examples of this. You can use videoscopic guidance. If you put a video, there's advantages. The image is clearer, it's closer to you, and importantly too, it's a very important thing, tool for learning and teaching especially in a teaching institution like this, this is remarkable. The whole team can learn together, not just the operating surgeon. Long shafted instruments, you have to learn. They are all available. The, the, uh, the, the dexterity involved in it takes a little bit of a learning curve, and this will aid operating through a small hole. So this is a knot pusher. Can you play the video? Can you run the video? Yes. So this is a knot. This is a knot pusher. It helps because if you want to put your tie knots into deep into the patient's chest cavity through a small hole, it's difficult. So a knot pusher is an aid that you tie the knot outside of the body and you push the knot down into the operating site. So this takes time to learn, but it's certainly something that enables minimally invasive surgery. Better still, no need to tie knots. So this is a core knot device. A core knot device, you have a gun-like device here. You just punch on it onto the suture and you don't need knots. 
the note is made to you but for you from this device this saves a lot of time not only saves a lot of time but it saves you from trying into small small holes yeah so if you have used this you can see this this is a quite a remarkable innovation Perhaps one of the biggest innovation that helps minimally invasive aortic valve is what is called a stutulous valve technology. So we've seen tying knots from the outside. We've seen tying knots from the inside with the core knot. Advancement of that technology is no need to tie any. There's no sutures at all. So stutulous valve is a technology that has no sutures. And the valve is put on this uh, introducer tube a handle that delivers it onto the side, the valve is expanded. So this can be done through a experienced uh, surgical team, but it can also be teach because they are guiding switches to it. So this method is not unreproducible. You can teach uh, junior surgeons to do it. An example of this sutulous valve implantation this patient has aortic stenosis. Uh, this is done through a mini stenotomy. A transverse aortotomy is made. This disease valve is now excised. You can see it's very thickened. That's calcium here. We decalcify the valve. That is uh, nice and clean. We size the valve. Valve come in different sizes. When we have chosen an appropriate size valve, in this situation here, we put some guiding, three guiding sutures it is into the nadir of the aortic uh, annulus. This holds up the annulus and this acts as a parachute to the valve. And this is the sutulous valve mounted onto its introductory handle. These three sutures are just guiding sutures will be removed at the end of the procedure. The valve is lowered down by two release steps, an inner ring and an outer ring is removed and the valve is uh, uh, deployed. And there is a short 30 seconds uh, balloon expansion of the inner ring. The valve is made by 19 also, it expands to heat. So you put heat, in cold, it collapses. And this is the end result. So it can be done very fast. It can be done through minimally invasive surgery. And it's certainly technology that helps it. So for the first part of this lecture, I wanted to talk about evolution of AVR, poetic stenosis. So we have talked about how the different designs of mechanical and tissue valve, how tissue valve usage has predominated over mechanical valve. We have touched on the introduction of minimally invasive surgery, and we have talked about rapid deployment suture as well. Now, part two. This is a revolution indeed, because before TAVI, open heart surgery was required. Now with TAVI, it is truly minimally invasive. But most are run through a transfemoral approach. So with a prick in the groin, this valve can be implanted without the need for open heart surgery. And this changed the landscape of uh, treatment of aortic valve stenosis. So what is TAVI? It's transcatheter aortic valve implantation. There are two approaches. One's a transfemoral, one is a transapical. 95% of the cases are done transfemoral these days because the devices uh, have got a sleeker delivery tubes have got smaller, enable them to put in most of the femoral artery sizes. So this valve is now being tailored in and it is not to be confused by the terms that some people use as TAVA. TAVA means trans aortic aortic valve replacement. It is not replacement because the leaflets are still there. The disease leaflets are being pushed to the aortic wall. So the actual term, if you go into nomenclature and semantics, it should be TAVI. It's an implantation. I make the distinction because there are some implications of leaving the leaflets behind. 
as we will talk about. Now, two, there are many Tawi valves in the market, but they are basically made out of two designs. One of which is a balloon expandable, the one on the right of your screen, the one on your left is a self-expandable device. The prototypes of this, uh, the core valve for the uh, metronic core valve for the self-expandable, the Edward Sapiens uh, generation for the uh, uh, balloon expandable valve. We have used this uh, for more than 10 years. We've got some experience with both of these valves. With the introduction of this, this is remarkable burst in how technology uh, advances uh, adoption. You can see the number of sites has sprung up remarkably, the number of procedures being done year on year. So much ex explosion in the US. And has, that, has this taken over some of the surgical work? Yes, you can see the explosion of this is TAVI, surgical AVR has now uh, reduced uh, to somewhat. Why has TAVI been so successful? It started with this trial. This trial is called the partner trial, partner one trial. This partner one A and partner one B. We start with partner one B first, which was the correct way any trial should be done. Partner one B, looked at TAVI versus medical therapy in patients who were rejected for surgery. That means inoperable, too sick, too old, too frail. And you can see in this chart, TAVI did much better, much better in terms of survival. So it moved on to what the real question they wanted to answer was this. This is partner called 1A, was TAVI versus surgery? And at 24 months, no difference in survival. So it was non-inferior. So with this, it boomed. The boom of TAVI was uh, uh, accelerated and many more trials come soon after that. Uh, and then what we know right now, all these trials are landmark trials. What we know is it is superior versus medical therapy for patients who are very, very high risk and inoperable. It is non-inferior to surgery in all the other groups. The big question we ask now, yeah, if the patient is inoperable, sure, get TAVI. If the patient is high surgical risk, probably if the patient is older, get TAVI. What about the intermediate risk? What about low risk? Shall we use TAVI? Shall we recommend TAVI or shall they get AVR? So the questions that need to be think. The one in the green box, stroke and vascular problems, heart block, pacemaker need, yeah, a little bit higher with TAVI, but they have largely overcome with the uh, evolution of better devices, better delivery mechanism. The one in the red box, still questions to be asked regarding TAVI. We don't know how long this valve is going to last. I'll show you in a few slides what, what I mean by this. Paravalvular leak is still a problem. That's why I make a distinction. This is TAVI implantation. This is not replacement. The old valve there with its calcium leaflets has some implications. And also the cost. At least in our place, the cost of the TAVI, TAVI valve, this is valve versus valve, not procedure. The valve, it's probably 10 to 15 times the cost of a surgical valve. So whether our local health economics can uh, support this drive for using TAVI. Now let's talk first about durability of the TAVI valve. This is, I take you back to surgical AVR. This is a peri mount valve. Surgical AVR has been used for many years. What can you expect? If you put it in a patient of 60, 65 years old, you tell the patient that this valve will last you 15 to 20 years without reoperation. How do you compare this with TAVI? This is TAVI data showing structural valve degeneration. As low as five years, this valve shows features of degeneration. So if you want to use it in a low risk patient, in a younger patient, you have to seriously think about this. This valve is probably not going to last. We don't have full data yet, but early data shows uh, 
some questions about the durability of this valve. Why do we think there is an Tawi valve doesn't last so long? It's probably related to what is called crimping. Now crimping, to put this valve in from the femoral artery all the way in, it has to be delivered onto a small tube. And small tube, it's expanded. So small tube to the femoral artery, and these are the delivery system. So the valve comes like this. You have to crimp it onto this tube. And the smaller you crimp, probably the more damage to the leaflets. Whereas if you think about it, the surgical valve, what you get, Let me go back a slide, please. Yeah. Yep. The surgical valve, if this is your surgical valve, this is what you get. No crimping. Yeah. No touch leaflets. So this is addressed in a few papers. I've brought up two papers to show some important finds, whether they affect on crimping of the leaflets. The duration of crimping is important. The smaller you crimp, you can make the delivery tube smaller, which industry is doing to put into all femoral arteries the more it's going to damage the leaflets, you have micro tests. So, and it doesn't improve with time. So the, part, so the durability is of concern. The second question raised with TAVI is survival with TAVI. This is TAVI versus sutureless AVR. I just pick up one. You can go and look in the literature, TAVI versus AVR. Uh, I, I was quite surprised to see the curve diverged so fast. This is survival. This is the hardest end raw data that you can get. So TAVI patients do not do so well in terms of survival. Why? Probably this. Para valve will leak. So you implant a TAVI valve. The valve, the, the native, native uh, calcified leaflets are still there. When you have a lot of calcium, this valve doesn't sit perfectly. You have small holes beside it that they may leak. And this is paravalvular leak. And when you have paravalvular leak, it depends on how much calcium you have on the leaflets. And it depends on where the position of the valve you put in. In this, in this example, the calcium is seen more in the left coronary cast and hence the paravalvular leak is most here. So this is what is seen in most uh, TAVI valve. And we know, we know this, this, kind of this kind of data has been duplicated. The presence of paravalvular leak after TAVI leads to death, higher risk of death. Patients do not tolerate paravalvular leak, even mild paravalvular leak. And this data like this uh, uh, is the evidence for that. And do you think paravalvular leak would go on some, I, I, I was involved in the TAVI program in my initial experience, we said paravalvular leak, self-expanding valve, it'll get better with time. No. This is both for the balloon expandable and self-expandable valves. Once present, it stays on. It doesn't go off. This data is, you com compare, compare the... We compare the one in the bowl and in the hatch, the bowl in the hatch for two different types of valves. Once it happens, it stays there, hoping that it will go off. It's a fallacy. It's a false uh, hope. Next, cost. Big concern. As I told you, it's about 10 to 15 times of the surgical valve. This is a Kelly quality uh, quality uh, assessment of uh, health economics, cost effectiveness, and it's shown that TAVI may be cost effective for patients who are non-operable, but certainly patients who can return surgery, a surgical AVR is recommended in terms of cost effectiveness. So the question we ask ourselves, who should get TAVI, who shouldn't get TAVI? So, we see, say, 92-year-old great-grandmother. She has severe aortic stenosis. She's, in, she's hardly moving. She's in functional class 3. She has diabetes. She has peripheral vascular disease. So she's got abnormal kidney function. She's got problems with her hips. So what should we do for her? She gets a TAVI. This is very appropriate patient to get a TAVI. On the other hand, 
Who's not? Probably a 70 year old retired politician, remains very active physically and sexually. He's got high blood pressure, a little bit high cholesterol, but otherwise he's very fit. Should he get heavy? Probably not. Yeah. And this diagram, this actual gentleman had a surgical AVR twice. Yeah. He didn't get heavy. Yeah. So this is appropriate use of that. So part two. Summary, who should get TAWI, who should not get TAWI. TAWI is shown to be non-inferior for the patients with uh, high and intermediate risk. So the recommendation is surgical AVR should be given who patients who are less than 75 at low surgical risk whereas TAVI should be reserved for patients more than 75 who have high risk or who cannot withstand surgery. All other patients should TAVI or AVR should be discussed in a heart team fashion where the considerations of the patient's age, risk scoring, anatomy, and cost concerns is taken into, uh, into play. This is our own heart team. So TAVI was the prototype, uh, uh, aortic stenosis and the TAVI program was a prototype of how we wanted to develop a heart team. And this has, it's a good model. It has since moved on to mitral, moved on to coronary, moved on to aortic work. So it gives us a cross disciplinary uh, discussions and that's how no patient will get a TAVI if it's not been signed off by a surgeon, by an interventional cardiologist, by an anesthesiologist. So all of them have to agree that this is a TAWI patient to make sure the patient gets the most appropriate treatment. Okay, the last part of my talk, part three. So we've heard about evolution, we've heard about revolution of TAWI. Let's move on. What's next? Is there a role for AVR, surgical AVR? Now, if you think of these two valves, what are the limitations of these two valves? Mechanical valve limitation is you need to have warfarin rest of your life and its problems. Tissue valve, it doesn't last. So what if we can address these two disadvantages of these two valves? So let's Let's start with the uh, let's start with the mechanical procedure. There is a unique valve in the market called the ONX valve. I'm not promoting this valve, but just to show how the trials have gone. This ONX valve is different from all the bileaflet valves because it has these three different special features. One is leaflets open 90 degrees up. The other bileaflet valves open to about 80, 75 to 80. It is made from something called pure pyrolytic carbon. When you have these two features, the, the hemodynamics across the valve is excellent. The washout is excellent. Thrombogenesis is less. That means the, it's less likely for blood to clot on this valve compared to the current previous generation of bileaflet valve. Additionally, there's a design called a flat inlet. And this if valve, if you have seen it, and some of my colleagues here have seen it, it has a taller housing and it prevents uh, the, the, so the, the sutures, if you use pledgets, into the flow of the blood. So again, this leads to less thrombogenesis. It lose, leads to less thrombus from uh, penis formation. Now, that's in theory, but this has been put to test. This is called a proactral. Proactral look at giving less, less, uh, uh, warfare, uh, less INR control. So traditionally, if you have an aortic valve replacement, mechanical, you want the INR control to be within the range of 2.0 to 3.0. In the uh, proactral with the ONX, they drop it down to 1.5 to 2. That means the patient doesn't need to have such a high INR, meaning to say, and this has been proven when you don't need to have such much blood thinning, there is much less of bleeding complications. So this is a huge advantages. 
and there's no penalty to pay from a lower INR in terms of thrombosis. So this valve allows this, and now it's an FDA approved valve for lower INR. It's the only mechanical valve that's been approved and in the guidelines for this. Better still, if you can get rid of warfarin totally, this will be a big gap changer. This is the PROACT 10A. This trial is ongoing. We should get results in a year or two. That means uh, on one arm, you don't need warfarin at all. It's been given with epixaban, which is a normal direct anticoagulant. And if you don't need warfarin, you don't need INR text, it will change the patient's life. It will use, the, it, will, it, it will certainly, you, uh, uh, it certainly lead to much better usage of the aortic valve if you don't need to have a uh, mechanical valve if you don't need warfarin. So we look forward to this trial very closely. On the other hand, what about the biological valve? We said that the Achilles seal to this is its lack of durability limited. What if we can make this tissue valve more durable? So there's this new valve on the tissue space called the Inspiris Resilia valve. The highlight of this is the Resilia tissue. Now, what is a Resilia tissue? Resilia tissue is a technology that has been made that would increase the lifespan of this valve from calcific degeneration. You see, when a tissue valve is been, uh, it's been made, it's been designed, it needs to be protected with glutaral dehyde, a solution. Glutaral dehyde is there because it needs to, it needs to have, in, uh, it, it promotes integrity of the collagen so that this valve does, leaflet doesn't shrink. This is a good thing why glutaral dehyde is given. But the side effect of glutaral dehyde is it promotes calcium to bind to the uh, aldehyde ends. So by calcium, it causes calcific degeneration. Now, this, this uh, new technology of resilient tissue caps the aldehydes and it prevents calcium from forming. So it doesn't need to be in wet, it, it can dry storage no glutaral dehyde. And it's postulated that this will increase the durability of the valve and decrease the degeneration. And this is an example of what is seen in the, uh, in the lab. You can see the resilient tissue uh, versus the current uh, perimount valve treated with glutaral dehyde. And you can see lack of calcification in the lab. And this is two studies up to five years, quite remarkable one in uh, Europe, uh, one in uh, the US, the command trial, and uh, European aortic feasibility trial, the highlight of which is zero structural valve degeneration up to five years. This is quite remarkable early data. Then it, there is uh, a lot of hope and promise that this valve is going to outlive the current batch of tissue valve by a, quite a big margin. So the summary of future generation, future projections would be, on one hand, the mechanical valve, if we can get rid of anticoagulation or less anticoagulation together, this would be a game changer. On the tissue space, if you have a extended durability, then already what is good durability now, this will again be a big change for our patients. So I asked myself a question, what I think would be the future? Is it TAVI? Yes, for certain elderly patients. What about such younger patients? Now, if you can put a good valve in, in a minimally invasive fashion, that's number one, think minimally invasive. Number two, if you don't need sutures, that's even better. But perhaps you want the best valve in, in this group. It could be, the best of class in a tissue valve, which we just say, probably the resilient tissue valve, or the best of class mechanical valve, in this case, an onyx valve. So we wait for these two trials. We wait for the data with a lot of hope. So finally, 
ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to summarize this uh, lecture in the following. We've shown you an evolutionary process in surgical aortic valve being the gold standard of treatment for say, severe aortic stenosis. We have talked about mechanical and bioprosthetic valves and their guidelines of usage. We've talked about minimally invasive aortic valve approaches. We've also talked about the revolution that has been uh, brought to us and the benefit of our patients in terms of TAVI. It's important to note which patients should get TAVI so the appropriate uh, resource of therapy is given to the right patient. And finally, there's a lot of hope for the future. If we can look into the crystal ball, perhaps the Onyx valve, perhaps the Resilio valves, one of these will be true game changers in this field. I thank you all very much for your kind attention, and I thank you very much for the privilege of giving this talk. Thank you, Jaswan, for the fantastic uh, talk. One more, ladies and gentlemen, give applause to Dr. Jeffrey Jaswan Dillon. Okay. So now we continue to uh, uh, discussion. Yeah. I would like to open uh, three questions first from the audience and after that uh, the audience from the online Zoom meeting can also uh, put a, a question in the, the chat. Yeah. So we, we can uh, give the question to Dr. Cheswan. So please, three questions, tiga pertanyaan. Yes, one. Ada lagi bertanya? Okay, two. Ada lagi? Okay, three ya. Tiga dulu ya. Okay, silakan Mike. She can speak uh, English, Indonesia, but yeah. cannot Japanese. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sir. Okay. You can try. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for uh, Dr. Jasmine for give us lecture to understand the evolution Kurang of jelas, FER. Yeah. Uh, I want to know about the famous FER. You are, uh, we already know the indication. We must treat the patient to FER. But uh, how about the selection? Which patient we can be treat with the famous FER. Is there any uh, contraindication that we can treat the, pen, can the, treat the patient with famous FER? The selection, which patient we Stand, can... Standless. Standless FER. Standless, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, sutureless FER. All right. Very, uh, very the good. selection. Sure. Second question is about if we, if we done the FER with the stainless, if we must uh, suture us, if we must redo or re, uh, do a FER again to the patient with suture of uh, FER, is there uh, any difference, difficulty? Is more difficult uh, with the conventional FER than with the suture of FER? That because the the stand is attached to the aortic wall. Is there any difficulty? Do we must prepare the aortic wall or not? Maybe it's or it's my question. Thank you. Right. So the two questions. Uh, one is the indication of a sutilus valve, which patients are appropriate. First, it has to be aortic stenosis or predominantly aortic stenosis. It's not suitable for pure aortic incompetence. That's number one. Yeah. Number two, there is a, a ratio that's being mentioned, the ratio of the STJ to the aortic annulus. You cannot have an STJ that's narrow, that narrower than the aortic annulus. So there is a there is a measurement uh, indication for that, and there is a size. The size uh, it's made for size 19 to 25 annulus. So that's a measurement size. Uh, other than that, it can be used for uh, most aortic stenosis. 
second question was how, in terms of redo after a sutureless valve, how difficult it is. It can be potentially difficult, or if you're lucky, you get it no difference at all. The, mat the material made by it is nitinol. Nitinol is quite inert. It doesn't really stick very well to the aortic wall, but we don't know after 10 years, we don't know after 15 years. Those that are, I have not had an experience of having to redo yet, honestly, but I've seen reports of it. Some are easy, some are not easy. Similar question would raise is how to do an AVR after a tabby. Yeah. But if you, had, if you have a patient that you are planning to do an AVR after, the a TAVI or one of these sutureless valve, the backup plan in your mind is you have to be able to think that this might not be a redo AVR. You might need to do a root replacement. Okay, one question again. If, uh, maybe if, uh, after uh, sutureless AVR, this patient have a pre-vessel disease or a coronary disease that need to be uh, bypassed with Graph. Is there any uh, strategy to the operation to bypass the, the bypass coronary because there is a stainless at the aortic assignment? Is to put you, the top end, I think. Oh, yeah, the, no problem. You, oh, can, no problem. You, you can do that. No problem. Can combine AVR and uh, sutureless valve AVR, no problem. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, terima kasih, Mr. Manto. Next question. Yeah. Okay. This is from medical student. Good. Okay. Mike, yeah, boleh. Uh, good afternoon, doctor. Um, first of all, thank you for the opportunity and a wonderful presentation, by the way. And there's some questions I would like to ask. And as you have previously mentioned, that. Uh, KV procedure is more recommended to older group of people. We know that prosthetic uh, uh, thrombogenic and this group of people also comes with, uh, uh, usually comes with history of stroke and probably as a future general practitioner, can I recommend this procedure of KV to pe uh, people with history of stroke or is there any further consideration uh, as a doctor should make. Thank you. I didn't get your full question and I'll repeat it, but don't worry. You're asking uh, whether we can do an AVR on a patient that has stroke yes, before? Yes, history of stroke, yes. Uh, Is yeah. there any risk for them? Uh, yeah, yes, I, yeah, yeah, sure. I, I think the question is not just for AVR, it's for general, whether we can do open heart surgery for a patient who had stroke before. So we have to work out, get the history of the patient's stroke episode, number one, to see why was the stroke, whether it was related to a bleed or whether it was related to ischemia. And find the reason of this, the stroke uh, and also reassess the patient whether he, there's a risk, higher risk of stroke during this heart surgery, which there will be. A patient who had previous stroke will have a higher risk of stroke, certainly but it doesn't mean that he cannot do it. We can still do it if we think that there is no additional risk compared to before. Okay. Yes, yeah, thank you happy, very yeah? much for the insight, sir. Okay, happy? Happy. Ah. <laughs> okay, the next question, the third one. Bisa buka masker kalau nggak jelas. Kadang-kadang masker ini mau nggak jelas. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting lectures from Dr. Swandilan. And I have two questions. The first one uh, is with regard to the leaflet calcification. Uh, how far can we go? How far, how far should we go for the TAVI? Is there any grading or, or is, if, if it is heavily calcified, should we start uh, first? We decide to do surgical output from the start. And then my next, uh, my second question was, uh, is there any experience you can share with us and how, how to start a new, uh, for a new unit to start the transcatheter uh, treatment, especially for the new generation? Thank you very much. Yes, so two very good questions. Now, calcification and selection of patients for TAVI. There is no absolute 
contraindication in terms of TAVI, in terms of con uh, calcification, but the site and of the calcification is very important. If you have calcification, you think it's very close to coronary ostia. A lot of supra valve calcification there, you might think twice because there will be there might be coronary problem. Likewise, if you have a bicuspid valve, which is a relative contraindication for TAVI initially, but now TAVI, many bicuspid valves get TAVI, but when we get bicuspid valve with heavy calcification, we don't do it because the complications are much higher. You know? Not in terms of just uh, embolization, coronary problems, but also for paravalvular leak. The more calcium you have, the valve is not going to, the valve is going to sit less perfect. There'll be a lot of irregular ages there. So in that case, I just did one last week, which was my friend actually. The patient was my good friend's elder brother who told me he doesn't want surgery. So we had to convince him A to Z why he should not get TAVI. So he had an AVR and fortunately, Alhamdulillah, he did very well. So I think the selection of patients were good. Question number two, how to start the TAVI program? You need to get a few important things uh, right at the start. One, you need to have a multidisciplinary team who are committed, meaning a cardiologist, a surgeon and an anesthesiologist to start with and radiological backup to interpret the scans that you're going to take. So you need to get a core people because and they need to be all of them need to be there for every case. You cannot have their members of this team as part time. So you have to select a core people. Number two, you need to have organizational support. Because there'll be a lot of challenges, there will be learning curves. You might have some challenges at the start in terms of patient selection, in terms of results too, and the organization needs to understand what you're trying to do and to back you up. I think those are the two critical areas. And because investment is required for you to set up a hybrid lab or hybrid OT, and that needs a lot of funding. And training of the team needs funding. So organization and selection of patients, the selection of personnel who are committed are key to success. Okay, now we continue to question from audience online, from Dr. Ronald uh, from uh, Jakarta. He's a cardiothoracic surgeon. There are two questions. The first is, uh, how do you monitor of effectiveness of Apex Saban in AVR mechanical valve. And the second is, uh, which aortic valve surgery method recommendation in pediatric case? In pediatric. Uh, the second question? The AVR. AVR for the pediatric. What, what, so what I think he's asked is, uh, about the bio or the mechanical, I think. Right. The uh, uh, Apex Saban trial, the ProAct 10A, monitors everything that is in a trial of any mechanical valve, any, any heart valve, in fact. So thrombosis, bleeding, thromboembolic rate, and uh, 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 whatever endpoints that survival stroke rate. So all of that has been taken in both arms. Uh, the preliminary result, surprisingly, was presented in STS. There was no difference between Apex Zaban and Warfarin. So this is very interesting. Yeah. The preliminary results. Huh? So we'll wait until next year and see whether this is true or not. Uh, second question, pediatric group, very good question. There's always been a choice of a dilemma with the aortic valve in pediatric patients. Well, if you can use a biological substitute, that will be the best. I think as options available would be if ROS is available for this kind of patient, that would be something the ROS procedure to consider. If, uh, if a valve preservation is uh, important, uh, is possible, this would be something to, to consider. Uh, if not, then you have to replace the valve. Uh, we have gone back and forth. In children, 
we have this group of teenage children who were sent to us by um, our pediatric cardiologists who were very against the use of warfarin. But we found out that if you put in a tissue valve in somebody at the age of 15, because you don't, you want to avoid warfarin, you want to, especially in, in ladies, you want them to have childbearing age to go and to get, to get married and get pregnant. It didn't work because the valve lasts three, four, five years in this group. They have accelerated degeneration in this very rapidly growing patient. So we end up now coming back probably use a mechanical valve in this patient, unless the family and the patient are open to have two uh, repeated, uh, two redo operations with tissue valve in close succession. Okay, thank you. Terima kasih, Dr. Ronald di Jakarta ya. Oke, silakan kalau ada yang teman sejawat yang online, itu bisa, kalau mau langsung If you want to direct uh, uh, question to Dr. Jeswan, you can raise your hand. Yeah. Oke, okay. pertanyaan berikutnya audience yang ada di offline, yang tadi, yang berikutnya siapa? Oke, okay. satu, yang satunya lagi, ada silakan, Dr. Bindu, silakan. Thank you for the time, uh, for Dr. Jason. I would like to ask uh, two questions. The first question may be about the resilient technology. Uh, how much extend the time it could provide the patient uh, versus compared to the conventional uh, perimon valve? And maybe the second question regarding the increasing number of TAFI procedure uh, in this era. Uh, have you been experiencing redo surgery after the TAFI procedure. Is there any difficulties and how we should prepare for this procedure? Maybe thank you. Good questions. Uh, the resilient issue, I think, I look in my crystal ball, I don't have an answer. We don't know. But the early data up to five years shows very promising. In the lab and clinical zero SVD, usually It's about time for the five years in all tissue valves, you start to see some percentage of it. Yeah? So all likelihood, maybe 10 years more, maybe 15 years more, we don't know. Because it is, it's, it's a huge question you brought up because if, if it's 15 to 20 years more, we're looking at a valve that might last 30 years, we might even, a patient in 40 years old can get this valve. Yeah? So it will change the landscape. Uh, uh, And uh, have I seen a patient who need AVR after TAVI? Yes, difficult, difficult operation. It depends on which TAVI valve. If you have the self-expanding, it covers the whole root. You might think that you want to have a, may, your backup plan would be to do a root operation instead of just an AVR. If it's a self-expandable valve, the valve is low profile, just at the uh, annulus. That you might be able to get it out, but the force associated with that is quite strong. That is where the, where the sewing ring uh, sits on the annulus. In that case, I have not had that in the back of my mind, whether I can just excise the leaflets, leave the TAVI uh, suture ring, the TAVI ring there, and then put a valve inside. Is it what they call a valve in valve? A valve in valve is a term of TAVI into a surgical valve. Oh. Okay. So what, what the question gentleman is asking is a surgical valve after TAVI. Okay. So the, it's, it's uh, the sequence of which. So there are four, few permutations. One is somebody who comes and said, absolutely, I don't want no surgery. So say this is 60 years old, don't want surgery in my hospital we don't offer TAVI yeah. because 60 years old, I don't know this valve will last five years even. I don't know. But if the patient insists he wants to pay for everything, he takes the risk, maybe you put in a TAVI at 65 years old, the valve degenerates. Then he gets a TAVI in TAVI. He gets a second TAVI. Or you said, this is it enough. You get, a, you get an AVR now. 
So you can have the other way around too. You put in a surgical valve at the age of 65, the patient is now 80 years so the surgical valve has degenerated. Now this is the term valve in valve. You get a TAVI into that uh, off palm, I mean, it's, it's uh, not open heart. So that's a good place to do. Okay. Yeah. But just uh, only for the bioprosthetic valve? Yes, eh? yes. I think the uh, question that earlier on said that, uh, that slipped my mind to answer was um, choice of valve in a pediatric. Yes. One of the other options we, we did not say was an Ozaki procedure. An Ozaki procedure is a valve reconstruction with leaflet. So if yeah. those are uh, quite familiar with that, that might be a possibility. It's operator dependent. You re reconstruct the leaflets with either pericardium, bovine pericardium, or, or some people are trying to use a substitute material called cardio cell to reconstruct it. Okay, thank you. Okay, is there any question? Dr. Oki or Dr. Hiru? Ada lagi, pertanyaan lagi? Ini menarik ya, discussions-nya. So, I'd like to ask about the cost. Now, this is the dilemma for our country, especially the Asia so Southeast Asia region, because the cost is, I think, is uh, if we do TAVI or, or other um, transcatheter of valve implementation, it's uh, the cost is maybe five times or six times uh, compared to the 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 normal area. So, what do you comment about this one? Right, the cost of the what the cost I put up five to six times or fifteen times is the cost of the prosthesis. The cost in actual cost when we did a simulation is if you get a good patient, good result, Tavi, the cost is about three times. Okay. Because the you save, you do the cost, the prosthesis, Tavi prosthesis is very expensive, but the hospital stays short. ICU stays short. So you save a lot of money there. Uh, but still it's three times. So I think how we have done it is we have worked on grants. Grants for X number of patients. It's not an open label insurance. Some private insurance to pay, but I think state insurance, I'm, I'm not as sure. I, I don't know of any that pays. Yeah. Okay. Ada pertanyaan lagi? Lain? Tidak ada? Semua happy? Okay, I think that's the final question for today, Dr. Jaswan, because tomorrow we still have a workshop and lecture before the workshop. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, then colleagues, uh, give applause to Dr. Jeffrey Jaswan Dillon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Terima kasih. Terima kasih moderator Dr. Dr. Yan Efrata Sembiring spesialis bedah spesialis PTKP konsultan dan Dr. Jeffrey Jeswan Dilon FCS CTS AM atas materi yang telah diberikan pada siang hari ini. Thank you to the moderator Dr. Dr. Yan Efrata Sembiring SPB SPB PTKP konsultan and Dr. Jeffrey Jeswan Dilon FRCS CTS AM for the information and the knowledge that has been shared to all of us. Dengan berakhirnya guest lecture tadi, maka berakhirnya acara pada siang hari ini. Sampai jumpa di acara besok Harvard Surgical Course yang akan diadakan di Erlangga Surgical Anatomy Development Center di gedung FK Unair. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of today's event. I would like to offer my apologies for any mistake that may have been made as well as to thank everyone for the participation and the attention. See you tomorrow at the Hall Park Surgery Course, which will be held at the Erlangga Surgical Anatomy Development Center, Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Erlangga. Terima, Terima kasih. kasih. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.